great summer break, of course. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, which is uh, Anthony Alexander um, Christidis, who is a, a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Statistics at the University of British Columbia in um, Vancouver. And um, Anthony is speaking um, today about a new ensemble learning framework for high dimensional data. And um, the great news also is that Anthony is going to join CCB as a computational scientist beginning of next year. So we are uh, very much looking forward to that, of course. Um, other than that, without further ado, I would uh, hand it over um, to you, Anthony. And I think um, we discussed beforehand that questions during the talk uh, are, are fine, but folks should also feel free to kind of like post questions in the chat and there will be some time, I think, um, after the talk also um, for the discussion. So with that, um, over to you, Anthony, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm going to share screen here. All right, so uh, yeah, so as Ludwig, uh, Ludwig mentioned, uh, my talk is uh, going to introduce uh, a new ensemble learning framework to model high dimensional data, which is uh, obviously very common when you're dealing with uh, omics data. Um, and uh, also, yeah, as Ludwig mentioned, if you have any questions at any time, let me know during the talk and also at the end. Um, I'm hoping I left enough time for a question session. We ran out of time last time, but I'll try to go a little quicker this time. Um, uh, yeah, so just a quick overview of the talk. Um, so I'll first do a brief review of what ensemble methods are, since it's the central topic of the talk. I'll go over an example application to show where they can be used, and also to show the, the pitfalls or the disadvantages of current state-of-the-art ensemble methods. Uh, I'll introduce the, this new ensemble learning framework, which is uh, what I developed during my, my doctoral studies at UBC in the Department of Statistics. Um, and then I'll talk about a related topic to uh, complement this new ensemble learning framework called dynamic predictions. I'll go over some classification examples using gene expression data. I'll talk about some extensions and I'll discuss some aspects related to robustness, which is when uh, your data may contain some uh, unusual observation. Um, and specifically, um, I'll talk about a new contamination uh, framework for high dimensional data, which is gaining a lot of popularity in the, in the literature. Okay, so quite a bit. So I'll try to get it done in 45 minutes to leave at least 15 minutes for talk for questions at the end. Okay, so uh, for omics data, as everybody here probably knows, so where we're, when we're dealing with genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, or meta metallobomics uh, data, um, it's, it's a very specific type of data. So if we define the number of predictors to be P, for example, genes or RNA transcripts, proteins or metabolites, and the number of samples to be n. Well, typically in omics data, we have what's, what's called high dimensional data. So we have much more measurements or predictors than we have samples, which brings uh, a lot of statistical issues. Um, and then another uh, typical feature of, of omics data is we have groups of highly correlated predictors. For example, we can have genes that belong to the same pathway or biological process. And then another aspect, which I will talk a little bit, a little bit towards the end, which is what I'm working on during my postdoc right now, uh, which is uh, when we have data contamination. So for example, sometimes we have techno technical problems in sample preparation, or sometimes it's just uh, the feature of the data. We have rare molecular profiles, for example. Okay, so I'll focus first on the first two uh, uh, principal aspects of omics data, and then towards the end of the talk, I'll, I'll address the data contamination issue. Okay, oh, let me make it full screen, actually. I don't know why I didn't do that, sorry. All right. Okay, so uh, ensemble methods. So uh, ensemble methods are essentially most state-of-the-art ensemble methods are currently black box modeling uh, methods. So gener generally ensemble methods generate non-interpretable models uh, and many, many of them. For example, one I'll talk about today is random forest um, or gradient boosting. Uh, models are only useful if they're pulled together. Uh, the level of diversity between the models and the ensembles are not data-driven. It's usually, uh, uh, the models are usually, usually generated using randomness or um, heuristics. And there's not a lot of theory uh, developed for ensemble methods because it's very algorithmic and, and black box uh, type modeling. Uh, however, the big advantage of ensemble methods, which is why they're so popular, is because they typically achieve superior prediction accuracy in high dimensional prediction tasks. All right. So just to give a sort of clear picture of what ensemble learning is. So ensemble learning, as I mentioned, is multi-model prediction. 
So if we have a matrix of inputs, uh, let's say n rows by p columns, the rows represent the samples, the columns, the predictors, the measurements, for example, gene expression levels. And then we can also have a vector of uh, outputs. Um, if we're doing classification, for example, it could be uh, different cancer subclasses, for example. All right. And then in ensemble learning, we have multiple learners who basically have their own decision rules. And then in the end, we're going to combine them to come to a final prediction. So this would be the ensemble prediction uh, uh, final decision. All right. Uh, just to give a little more details. So uh, these learners are typically referred as weak learners in the literature. And the reason for that is because uh, not only do they have a low prediction accuracy on their own, but they're also usually not interpretable. Um, and I'll go over uh, the reason for that in just a second. Um, however, they're typically diverse. So they typically have different prediction rules um, and they typically use different subsets of predictors. So in gene expression data, we could have thousands of different genes and each of these learner could use a different subset uh, of the genes. And they can also uh, have overlap between them. All right. They don't have to use uh, unique genes in each of the learners. Okay. Uh, so uh, how does ensemble learning work? So let's say that these uh, f hat functions represent the weak learners, and then we get a new test sample. Let's denote it x naught. Then we get uh, g predictions if we have g models in the ensemble. And then uh, depending on the type of, of modeling that you're doing, if it's regression, you can average the prediction of each of these individual learners. Or if it's classification, what's most popular is typically majority voting. Uh, keep in mind that there's a lot of work on model aggregation. For example, there's the very popular uh, proposal by Bryman in 96 called stacking, which uh, involves an optimization problem to find the optimal weight uh, for the different models in the ensemble to use. Okay. Um, and then uh, later on, I'll talk about something called dynamic prediction, which is a new proposal that I proposed for my during my dissertation, um, which complements this new ensemble learning framework uh, I proposed. Okay. So why should we fix the current state-of-the-art uh, ensemble learning uh, methods? Well, there have been a lot of articles that appeared recently, including in the proceedings of the National, National Academy of Sciences or in Nature, that basically explain the danger of using black box algorithms, especially in the life sciences. Um, and so if, uh, I can probably share these slides uh, at the end and you can click on these links to, to, to get more details. Uh, but uh, yeah, I have to move on here. Um, all right. So uh, where does the predictive uh, power of uh, ensemble come from? So there's a bit of technicalities here. If you have any questions, let me know. So let's say that, again, we denote f bar here to be the average of the predictions for a regression ensemble. Then uh, some of you might have heard of something called the bias variance trade-off. Uh, of, of machine learning. So this is basically that the generalization error of, a, of, a, of an algorithm can be decomposed into its bias, its variance, and something called the irreducible error or noise. Um, and now, interestingly, if it's a single model method, it pretty much stops here. Interestingly, for ensembles, we can actually decompose the bias and the variance uh, further. So the bias of the ensemble turns out to be the average of the bias of the individual learners. And then even more interestingly is the variance of the ensemble can be decomposed as one over G times the average pairwise, sorry, the average variance of the individual uh, models in the ensemble and G minus one over G times the average pairwise covariance of the models in the ensemble. So as an example, let's say that we have 100 models, then uh, most of the variance term comes from the average pairwise covariance term between the individual learners in the ensemble. So if they're decorrelated, then that will lead to a good uh, to a low variance, which may lead to a, to a low generalization error. Okay, so uh, when we talk about something like random forest, which uses five hundred trees by default in the ensemble, the reason that it does that is because the individual models are are very weak. The individual trees they have a high bias and a high variance, but because we use uh, randomization to make them diverse, they have very low uh, pairwise covariances, which makes this variance term very low, which helps the prediction error of the ensemble, the generalization error of the ensemble. All right. So just to give uh, a bit more details, again, this is just pretty much repeating what I just said. So mo modern ensemble methods rely on weak 
but highly diverse base learners to reduce the generalization error. Uh, for example, uh, again, random forest uses 500 trees by default in most uh, packages in R or Python. And uh, if you can make the trees in the ensemble decorrelated, then that's very good for the variance term of the ensemble, which will lead to a lower generalization error, All right? Um, now, how is how are the trees diverse? Well, in random forest is based on randomization or in gradient boosting, it's using uh, heuristics, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, and on, on top of having a weak, uh, uh, prediction error, the base learners, and being non-interpretable, they also have very poor variable selection. So if you want to, for example, identify the genes that are relevant to predict an outcome, um, current state-of-the-art ensemble methods are not particularly uh, good for that. Okay, so to generate these diverse models in the ensemble, um, there's really two ways to do it. The first one is using randomization. So one way to do randomization is bagging, which is a random sampling of these samples. So um, that's the first way. The other way is to use the random predictor subspace method. There's many different variations of it. But in essence, it's basically, uh, for example, in random forest, when we construct a tree, we take a random uh, sample of the data and a random sample of the predictors. And we build a tree based on these two uh, random, uh, random selections. And then we do that 500 times. And that gives us 500 trees. Now, these 500 trees are very weak on their own because they only use uh, set of the predictors and a random sample of the data. But when we combine them, because they're diverse, then we get a good prediction error when we combine them. That's the first way to get a good generalization error for ensembles, this, uh, or to get uh, diversity between the models. The second way is to use boosting, which is a little more recent. So the uh, in the 90s, there was the seminal paper called uh, Adaboost. Um, which uh, you introduce something called adaptive resampling. And there is a lot of fancy theoretical results that shows certain optimality, um, certain optimalities if you use a specific uh, way to sample the data. Um, so in essence, boost adaptive resampling is I first sample my data, I fit uh, uh, my model, and then I compute the residuals on uh, the, the first model. And then I do an adaptive resampling where the observations that were poorly predicted by the first model have a higher probability of being included in the second bag. So this is, and then this is repeated many, many times. So this is what we call it adaptive resampling. It's not an equal weight of selecting each sample every time you sample the data. It depends on how well the samples were predicted previously. Now, the more, rec the more uh, modern way to do boosting is gradient boosting, which is essentially the sequ sequential refitting of residuals. So I have my original data, I fit a model, I obtain my residuals. Then I fit a model on the residuals of the first model. And then I have two models that have an ensemble, and then I repeat this process many, many times. So I have a couple of sketches here to try to help uh, visualize this. So first is for randomization. First, I take a, a bootstrap sample, or which is just a random sample of my original data. I also have a random uh, sample, uh, a random uh, subset of the predictors. So if I have a thousand predictors um, in my original data, I just take a random subset of it. And then based on these two uh, uh, random selections, I construct my first learner and then I combine it for the ensemble. That's randomization. So in essence, uh, this is, you can notice basically learning in parallel. So the first learner is independent of the second one. Uh, and then this is just for a random forest. Uh, for example, the way the random predictor subspace work is as at each split of my tree, I select typically random p uh, square root of p random predictors. And then I take the best one out of these uh, square root of p. So if I have 900 predictors, I take 30 at random. And then out of this, these 30, I determine which one is optimal based on the uh, entropy or, or whatever measure you're using. And then uh, this will be the predictor selected at, at that node. And then this process is repeated many, many times until the tree is uh, no longer fitting the data uh, well enough. Okay, for boosting, this is the, the little picture I put together. So I have my original data, I train my first learner, and then uh, I obtain my residuals, which I can call new data one. And then on these residuals, I train the second learner. I have two models now, this is my first ensemble. And then um, now what I do is I compute the residuals based on this ensemble. And then after that, I train my first learner on these new residuals and I repeat this process. 
All right. Now there's many, many variations of gradient boosting. There's something called a learning rate. Uh, there's something called uh, regularization. So gradient boosting has been studied pretty extensively over the last 20 years. And it's uh, there's a lot of algorithms now to, that have a different flavor of gradient boosting, but they all tend to work pretty well for prediction. Okay, so let's just give an application to show the pit, the shortfalls of the current uh, ensemble methods in the literature. So this, this is just a, a very um, uh, simple application where uh, we have 200 genes, and then our goal is to use these uh, 200 genes to try to predict TRIM32. So it's a tripartite motif containing protein 32, uh, which has been identified as a gene highly correlated with uh, Bardet-Bidel syndrome. Okay, this is from a, a proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences paper, which studied this data set extensively. So uh, because we have 200 genes, we want to make this data set high dimensional. What we'll do is we'll do uh, 100 and uh, we'll do uh, 50 random splits of the sample. So we have 120 samples originally. We'll do 30 for training and then 90 for testing. And we'll, we'll do this process uh, uh, randomly 50 times. Okay. We'll compare sparse methods, which are highly accurate single model methods. I'll talk about a bit about this in just a second. And uh, state of the art ensemble methods. We'll use two metrics. First will be the prediction error of the ensemble or the single model methods or sparse methods. And then in addition for ensembles, we'll actually compute the average prediction accuracy of the individual models in the ensemble, just to see uh, if the ensemble does well, do the individual models in the ensemble actually do uh, also do well, All right? And then uh, we report the prediction error. So let me zoom in a bit here. So uh, for example, uh, so random GLM is an ensemble method, and it actually it achieves one of the highest, um, the lowest prediction error for this data set in terms of predicting predicting trim thirty two. Uh, so in green it's the ensemble, but the individual models in in these ensembles have clearly a very very low prediction accuracy. Um, and then we can notice here that our GLM with one hundred model uh, models does significantly better than our GLM with five models. And the reason for that is because if I reduce the number of models, then the average pairwise covariance between the models becomes less important and the accuracy of the individual models becomes more important. Um, so for these black box type ensemble models, very much like random forest or gradient boosting, you need to have a lot of models, uh, even if they're uh, inaccurate. Um, and then um, here in blue, we have the sparse methods, which are highly accurate single model methods. So typically they have uh, uh, lower, a lower prediction accuracy than ensemble methods, but it's much better than uh, the accuracy of the models in the ensembles, all right? I don't know if I should stop here to ask if there's any questions or clarifications needed or... You can speak up or let me know. It's all good, okay. I guess I can continue, all right. Okay. Um, so I mentioned sparse uh, models, uh, sparse methods, which are uh, accurate single model methods. So just to give the context uh, a bit for some of them, which will be build the new ensemble learning framework. So let's say we're in the linear model setup, just for simplicity. I have my uh, data Y, which is the vector of uh, the response. X is my design matrix. I assume I make the classical assumptions about the linear model. Um, and then also I assume that P is much larger than N. So we're in this a case of high dimensional data and that the underlying model is sparse, which means that only a subset of the predictors are actually relevant to predict the response. So let's say only a subset of the genes are relevant to predict the outcome, say the cancer subset. Okay, so very popular sparse methods, which you may have heard of uh, are best subset selection. So in best subset selection, we minimize the, the squared loss in the linear model setup under the restrictions that my coefficient vector has at most T predictors. Um, and then this problem is what we call NP hard in that it's uh, computationally intractable uh, if P gets very large. So although there have been a lot of algorithms uh, developed recently in, in the last two, three or four years, to try to optimize this directly in the 90s and 2000s and 2010s. Typically, the way it was done is by using what we call a relaxation. So some of you might have heard of something called the lasso or the elastic net, which is basically a convex relaxation of the best subset selection problem. So this problem is 
convex. Thus, it's very easy to uh, optimize uh, this uh, objective function. All right. Okay, so uh, the motivation for the new uh, data-driven ensemble learning framework. So we want to have, so it's been acknowledged in the literature that we, there's something called the multiplicity of good models. So typically, especially when we have high dimensional data, we typically have more than one possible good model that fits the data well. Um, and um, our goal in the new ensemble modeling framework is to try to identify these good models. So we'll use, uh, we won't use any heuristics. We'll actually optimize a well-defined objective function uh, the individual model in, in the individual models in the ensembles are, will have, be interpretable and have high prediction accuracy on top of having a highly accurate ensemble. And also the level of sparsity and diversity between the models will be driven by the data. So instead of uh, having uh, the level of uh, sparsity and diversity for say the trees or the uh, linear models in the ensemble to be uh, determined uh, based on randomization heuristics, it will be controlled. Okay, so this is uh, one of the proposals in my dissertation called best split selection, which is essentially a generalization of best subset selection. So uh, instead of having, uh, as in best subset selection, a constraint on the vector here, so beta here is a vector uh, of dimension uh, p by one. Now I have a matrix of coefficients of dimension p by g. So uh, the columns represent essentially the beta coefficients of the different models, okay? So if I look uh, at column one, this will be the coefficients per the first model. Uh, if I look now at the first row, so these are basically the uh, coefficient values for the first predictor across the G models, okay? So the this uh, beta G here is in RP and this first row here obviously is in RG. Okay, and then the objective function is to minimize the sum of the losses of each of the models under the constraints uh, on the sparsity of the models. So the L0 norm of the columns and the L0 norm of the rows, which essentially controls how many times a predictor can be shared. So this will control the level of diversity between the models. Okay, so this is a pretty uh, computationally intractable problem. So best subset selection, if you just have one group, is already computationally intractable. So if we have multiple groups, it's even worse. Just to give you a bit of an idea. So uh, if I have, say, 15 predictors, and I want to count how many ways there are to split these 15 predictors into three models, where each model has at most 10 predictors, there's 171 million possible splits. Uh, and then if we just look at the best subset selection problem, so we, we just replace this three by one. So we just have one model and how many subset of 10 predictors do I have? It's 31,000. So this is only for 15 predictors. Um, and typically in omics data, we have thousands of predictors. So clearly um, this uh, this problem is, is much more computationally uh, intractable than best subset selection. And also this formula here is derived only for uh, full diversity. So a predictor can only appear in a single model. If you allow for sharing between the predictors, uh, it's, it's even worse. This number would be in the trillions. Um, and on top of that, uh, because T and U are, are parameters, we have to choose them by cross-validation. So this optimization problem has to be repeated many, many times. Okay. So in my dissertation, I propose a multi-convex relaxation. Uh, very much like the lasso was proposed as a relaxation, a convex relaxation for best subset selection. So this is uh, the sparsity penalty here. Uh, this is PD, a, a diversity penalty, and uh, optimizing this objective function is much more simple than this uh, problem here. Um, and um, I can point you to a couple of packages uh, here uh, that were developed in R and, and essentially they were C++ libraries, but they were wrapped in R packages um, that uh, um, basically implement the, this uh, optimization and uh, the, the user interface for these functions are, they, they have documentation. So it's very easy to use if you want to try it out. Um, and then um, also uh, in my dissertation, also I, I developed algorithms to optimize this directly. And then just to show you uh, the comparison to uh, other ensemble methods. So I recall that RGLM was the best black box ensemble method on this data set. Well, fast best split selection, which is the, the model I just presented, 
with only five models, achieves essentially the same prediction error as our GLM, random GLM with 100 models. But the accuracy of these individual models here in light blue is much, much higher. And also, I don't really have time to talk about it, but the variable selection of these individual models is also much, much better than uh, random GLM, which selects predictors randomly. So, and, and yeah, the nice feature here is that the individual models in this ensemble are pretty much just as accurate as, as these sparse, the, the models generated by sparse methods, which are single model, uh, highly accurate methods. So uh, we kind of have here a slam dunk in terms of prediction accuracy, variable selection, and interpretability of the individual models. All right. Um, dynamic predictions, I'll just talk about it briefly. So here in fast uh, in this ensemble, we only have five highly accurate models. And then uh, instead of uh, when we get a new test sample, instead of saying, okay, let's get the prediction uh, the, the prediction of each of these individual five models and then take the average, what we can do when we get a new test sample is try to determine which of these five ac highly accurate models, sorry, my screen is frozen here which of these five highly accurate models I should use for this prediction. So this is, and the model that will be used for a different test sample is different for each test sample, right? So what we can do is we can look at the uh, pr predictor measurements of a new test sample, for example, a new patient with a new genetic profile, and then look which model tended to predict uh, patients with that uh, a similar genetic profile based on our training data. Um, and then we say, okay, this is the model that we'll use to predict this new test sample. Okay, I don't know if I'm being clear here. If you have any questions at the end, you can uh, let me know. Uh, and then if we just compare again on the same uh, data set here, so dynamic one, here we're always using the best model available out of the five. And as we can see, the prediction accuracy compared to just taking the average of the five predictions is, is pretty significant. In fact, the prediction error is very close to zero, uh, which is very impressive for this data set. Nothing comes close to it. Um, and then if we just uh, make our life a little easier and say, okay, try to find the two best model for each patient, then the prediction uh, accuracy is still much, much better. And then uh, what matches the performance of taking the, the average of the five models without doing any of the selection is basically trying to find the, the best three models out of five. Okay, so this is, Another area of research, I'm in the process of writing a manuscript right now with my postdoc supervisor, and we're getting uh, very interesting results, so it's pretty promising. Okay, uh, I'll just talk about some classification examples here, not to bore you too much with details for the optimization. So uh, one thing we can do uh, and, uh, if we want to do a classification, for example, is just replace the squared loss in the objective function by uh, the logistic loss function to do classification. So here, um, again, I'll send you the slides later. You can click on all these packages that uh, has that contains the implementations and the, the manuscripts with the details. But uh, essentially what we'll do is we'll apply uh, this classification version of the algorithm to 10 gene expression data sets. So uh, N is the sample size, and this is the number of genes for each data set. Um, and uh, most of these data sets are to uh, identify different types of, say, lung cancer or uh, esophageal cancer or uh, thyroid cancer, et cetera, et cetera. And, and Anthony, uh, one yeah. quick question. These are microarray data sets, right? Yeah, these are mostly microarray data sets, yeah. So, so maybe one question that I was wondering along your slides um, for the data, um, uh, are there any like data assumptions to fit into your model? Um, it, 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 does the data need to be roughly Gaussian or um, um, how does it look like? Uh, yeah, so for the not, so they don't really need, the data doesn't need really to follow any type of distribution, but um, really the only time you would require uh, that the data follows a, a specific uh, distribution is if you want the theoretical results to hold for sure. So for example, people sometimes derive uh, prediction error bounds on their uh, on the results of their their, their algorithm, um, and uh, these bounds only hold if you make the strong assumption that, for example, your data follows a sub sub Gaussian uh, distribution, or that you don't have model misspecification that the data generating the the mechanism in which the data was generated follows specifically the linear model 
or a logistic model or yeah. Uh, otherwise, uh, for in terms of just empirical uh, applications, it doesn't really require to follow a specific type of distribution or any uh, other assumption. Yeah. So this could well be also RNA seq data where we then yeah. would have found data. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, so uh, yeah, what we'll do for these 10 data sets is do, do just a bit of pre-processing. Um, so in fact, actually the way I pre-process the data before applying the algorithm is kind of outdated. So we selected 100, 250, 500 or a thousand genes, but uh, using pairwise t-tests uh, with the, the von Ferrani correction for multiple testing. But nowadays, I saw a couple of papers recently where they have different ways to select genes before applying the algorithm, but which controls for the false discovery rates. So uh, it would be interesting for me to try to uh, rerun this uh, simulation uh, with the new uh, way to select genes before applying the algorithm. But uh, regardless, so these are basically the uh, average ranks over the 10 data sets. Uh, for, so this is for the misclassification rates and the uh, test loss prediction error. Um, so the highest rank obviously is one and uh, the uh, split methods, uh, uh, which is basically the, the new ensemble learning framework with the classification uh, loss function achieves the uh, best prediction error and test sample loss for uh, on average, regardless of the number of genes we select for applying the algorithm. So 100, 250, 500 or 1000, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the method does best uh, compared to these are sparse uh, methods. And here we have random GLM and RF. These are black box ensemble methods that use uh, randomization. And here we have extreme gradient boosting at the bottom here, which didn't do particularly well for this data set. Even though I tried to, I kind of cheated for extreme gradient boosting and really gave it the, the optimal tuning parameters, but it didn't seem to help for some reason. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, and then uh, just to give also an example how we can use these types of ensembles to uh, study uh, which predictors are important. So uh, let's take the one of the lung cancer data sets. So this data set has 58 samples and about 54, 675 uh, gene expression levels. Um, and uh, our goal here is to identify the cancer subtype. All right. Um, and then uh, if we use the uh, logistic elastic net, it selected 54 genes. And then if we use uh, the split logistic model, which is my proposal with the logistic loss function, uh, we produce 10 models and each model contains between 19, uh, 19 and 50 uh, genes. So these are sparse models. So they only select a subset of them. And there's a lot of overlap between the models. So there were 228 total, but each model themselves had between 19 and 50. All right. Um, and um, interestingly, uh, the ensemble selected, th so there were six genes that appeared in at least five models. And interestingly, the logistic elastic net selected none of them. So this kind of goes back to this idea of the multiplicity of good models that if you use a sparse method, you only get a single model. So you better get the genes right, right away. Whereas if you have an ensemble, you have a lot more uh, leeway because you have multiple models that have maybe different interpretations of the relationship between the, the, the predictors and the response. Um, and thus you can use more genes and have different, uh, uh, you have these diverse models and uh, you may pick up genes that were uh, not selected if you just have one model, all right? Um, and then this is just a quick little uh, note here that um, uh, the logistic elastic net had a misclass misclassification rate of 8%, which is actually the same as the individual models in these uh, 10 ensemble models. Um, so the, the, the ensemble had 10 models and the average prediction error uh, of these 10 models was also 8%. And when we combine these 10 models, then the ensemble achieves an MR of 6%. So- Is this part of the art though? Uh, say again, sorry? To my knowledge, uh, there was a pap paper who did a very similar ensemble knowledge. It seems very uh, on par that the current model scheme that you have right there. So does this compare 
well to, let's say, a very sophisticated single model. Trying to see what, mm -hmm. see, see if this is actually an improvement over, the, the ensemble is an improvement over, over a regular uh, classification. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, it's in classification. It's, so if, if it was regression, it'd be easier to, to tell if it's significant because we can compare, you know, we have the mean and the standard deviation, and then we can see if, you know, there's any overlap. In classification, it's a little harder. Uh, but um, uh, I would say that an improvement of, of 2% over, so this data set has been studied extensively in many papers and nobody really achieved an MR of lower than eight. So I would say that 6% is, is pretty significant. Um, and uh, yeah, but yeah, it, it's it's hard to tell whether it's statistically significant because uh, right. classification is a little trickier. It's not like in regression where we can actually do a, we have theory to determine whether this is actually statistically significant. So yeah. Makes sense. Okay, um, so I think I'll just talk about here for another eight minutes here. There's uh, a few other things I want to mention. So uh, in this talk, I mostly talked about parametric models or a parametric way to uh, generate these ensemble models. Uh, but it's it's uh, the idea is very uh, general in that we have uh, the loss function and then restrictions on the uh, predict number of predictors in each model and uh, how many times a predictor is shared. So this idea can be applied to discriminant analysis, PCA, kernel-based estimators, and more interestingly, tree-based ensembles. So this is a project I kind of started working a little bit already, which uh, basically I'm trying to do a non-random version of random forest called systematic forests. Um, and uh, the way to optimize this is thankfully there have appeared a lot of very interesting articles recently in the machine li learning literature that uh, show how to optimize a tree um, uh, and then uh, and the idea is to generalize their algorithm to have an ensemble uh, for these trees. So you're not only optimizing a single tree, but multiple trees at the same time. Uh, and um, yeah, so this is a big project uh, I look forward to, to, to do to apply the, the current new ensemble learning framework. Okay, and now the last thing I wanted to talk about, which is what I'm wor working mostly during my, my postdoc right now is uh, data contamination. Okay, so data contamination is um, when we have uh, certain uh, samples or cells, which basically correspond to a particular predictor for a particular sample, which may deviate for, from what you expect based on the rest of the data. So classically, from say the 60s up to 2010, the row-wise or case-wise contamination model is basically the only model that was, data contamination model that was studied, which basically means that uh, the entire sample is contaminated or the entire sample follows a different distribution from uh, the uh, assumed distribution of the data or the majority of the, the samples. A more recent one, which was uh, proposed in 2009 by actually my doctoral supervisor, Dr. Ruben Zamar, he proposed something which is much more realistic, especially when you have high dimensional data, which is called cell-wise outliers. So now in cell-wise outliers, we have for each sample, perhaps only a small subset of the predictors that are contaminated and they're uh, flagged by these black boxes here. And this is much more realistic because it's very rare that for a sample, especially if you have thousands of predictors, all of them are contaminated or follow a different distribution. Typically what happens is uh, only the this this row here is only flagged because only a small uh, subset of the predictors may deviate from what you would expect. Um, and statistically, identifying these cell-wise outlier rather than case-wise is much more much more complicated, both theoretically and computationally. But uh, there have been a lot of work in the last five years that really have very impressive results. Um, and just to show why the cell-wise contamination uh, uh, framework is much more relevant to high dimensional data, uh, let's uh, just give a, a short example here. So let's say that epsilon is the uh, probability that a uh, predictor for a particular sample is, is contaminated. So let's say that it's very small. Let's say that it's 0.5%, right? Then the expected proportion of contaminated rows by using basic probability, it's basically the binomial distribution, uh, is one minus one minus epsilon to the power of p. Uh, 
right? And then if we just say, okay, 0.5% for each cell and have a thousand predictors, then the proportion of contaminated rows is almost one. So basically each row will probably contain at least one uh, cell-wise outlier, even if the, the probability that, a, that the cell is contaminated is as, as small as 0.5. So uh, if we have high dimensional data and cell-wise outliers, then we'll typically have very, very few clean samples. And unfortunately, most robust methods that are developed in the literature uh, can only uh, sustain up to 50% of the samples that are contaminated. So uh, a lot of, uh, there was a, a sort of a hole in the literature and in the last five years, uh, a lot of uh, de developments were made. So just to give an example that cell-wise outliers is really more common when you have uh, omics data. So this is a prostate cancer data set from uh, this paper here. Um, and we have 136 samples with about 12,600 predictors. And now what we'll do is we'll apply a very, very powerful method that was published in 2018 called detect deviating cells that basically flags in each sample, each predictor, uh, which ones are deviating. And in red, uh, a red square corresponds to uh, a gene that is unusually highly expressed. And in blue corresponds to a gene that is unusually uh, that has an unusual low expression compared to uh, the rest of the data. Um, and as we can see, the majority of the samples have cell-wise outliers. Only the, uh, see this bottom quarter here has case-wise outliers. And in fact, the only reason that these are case-wise outliers is because it turns out that these samples were actually collected from a different laboratory. So if we look at data collected within the same laboratory, then we only really have cell-wise outliers. Um, and uh, yeah, and then uh, these are, I won't bore you too much with details here because I'm kind of running out of time, but these are all, uh, you, the references are there if you want to look at them later. These are all case-wise robust methods, um, which really uh, address this type of contamination in your data, not this one. But uh, recently there have appeared uh, a lot of articles uh, that are geared towards uh, this type of contamination here. And I'll point you to, uh, two particular papers. There's more now. There's about five or six that have popped up in, in the literature because it's so recent. But uh, these two papers by Roussier and Bosch and Raymakers and Rousseau in 2021 are really the two leading methods right now to try to identify in your, your, your omics data which samples are highly, which genes are unusually highly expressed or, or have a low expression level. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, this is just a, a method that I'm also developing in, in my postdoc, which uh, applies the new ensemble learning framework for the case-wise contamination model, this one. And uh, I put a link here to my archive. Uh, I think within the next two weeks, I will have a paper that it will uh, incorporate the new ensemble learning framework uh, with this type of contamination, with cell-wise contamination, with some interesting applications and examples. So. Uh, I think it's 12.45. I think I should stop here. Uh, sorry for talking probably a little too fast and including so much, but uh, if you have any questions, uh, please go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Anthony. Um, really great talk. I didn't think you went too fast. I, I could follow along very well. That was that was really nice. Um, are there any questions from the audience for um, Anthony? Yeah, um, I had kind of a background question about um, RGLMs. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the cases where they're working well, is it simply because of the G in GLM? That is like, does the addition of some appropriate non-identity link function just make it easier for the ensemble to find good models? And do you think that would be like a good area to work in? In the future. I, th I think uh, it's more to do with the, the variable selection algorithm for that method. So the way random GLM works is uh, it's kind of the GLM version of random forest. First, it does bagging. So you say you have 100 models, you do 100 random samples of the data. And then after that, it randomly selects uh, predictors. Um, and I think there's a default number that you randomly select. And then what it does is it does forward selection of these predictors. So that's how it, it, it does its variable selection. It's not really to do with the link function or anything like that. It's really just, the, yeah, that it, it, it does after the random selection. It also uses some greedy method to try to uh, 
only select a subset of them that are relevant to the to the response. And also a nice feature of RGLM, which is why sometimes it works really well, is because it also considers interaction terms. So uh, yeah, so it, they don't really sit in the documentation of the method, but uh, yeah, it, uh, it, it, uh, it considers interaction terms. And sometimes for, for, for omics data, it works well sometimes. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Yep. And Anthony, I I don't know whether I missed that, but um, how do you how how do your framework compare like just like computational runtime um, yeah. to <laughs> like some of the competitors? I guess um, these sparse methods they are they are kind of like the facet, but then you're doing um, kind of like a lot of computational work. I saw you do yeah. this primarily to go over to C++, but I'm yeah. wondering how do you compare and what kind of maybe tricks you use to get get this efficient? Yeah, so it's uh, there's a lot. So uh, so for most sparse methods are what we refer as convex optimization problems. So you can get the global solution very quickly. There's very good optimizers now. Uh, the, the models in my, or the methods in, in my dissertation for the new ensemble learning framework are not convex. Um, in fact, some of them are not even differentiable. So uh, the way to try to optimize them is to use a combination of uh, something called project, pr projected gradients or proximal gradients in combination with uh, something we call neighborhood searches or local searches. So these are methods that are very common in the operations research literature. But essentially, the, the, the idea is to get a good initial estimator and then search around that area to see if you can make an improvement. And then in terms of computation, computational time or complexity, um, I spent a lot of time trying to optimize it. Um, and sometimes it, it say you have a thousand predictors, it can take four or five minutes to, to, to compute. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's a lot, but uh, especially for high dimensional data and you compare it to sparse methods, which are essentially instant, but uh, it's it's the cost right now to try to make these these methods uh, to use these methods. Um, but uh, I mean, if you compare it to say you know using neural networks, I mean those can take you know days sometimes to run. So um, I guess four or five minutes is 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 not so bad of a price to pay. But could you make use of parallelization, just like for oh yeah, so, yeah. So in, in the yeah, in, in all these uh, packages I reference in, in my slides, uh, I've written the libraries in C++ and I use uh, OpenMP, which is uh, yeah, the multi, it's it's multi-threading that I use mostly to try to accelerate all of this. And unfortunately, I think it only works on Linux right now because I don't think OpenMP is supported by Windows. But uh, uh, yeah, if you run it on a virtual machine on Linux, then it, it works. Other, other questions for Anthony? I, I have a quick question. Um, yeah. Hi, Anthony, thank you. This was excellent. Um, can, you In one of your slides, you were talking about um, methodology that you're developing that basically helps uh, figure out the right model for the right input. So you were mentioning patients and you were talking about, you know, if the profile is similar. Yeah. Is, is that function that you're learning, are you learning that as part of your ensemble process or is that something that you're doing independently? That That's a question of itself that is really yeah. hard to say. How do you yeah. determine that a profile is similar? Yeah, it's, it's right now it's done independently. So first there's the training process of the ensemble. And then after that, once you have your test data, then you try to determine which one to use. So, but your question is really interesting because when I first started my PhD seven years ago, we were really trying to make it so that you can do both at the same time. But it was so complicated that we kind of gave up that project. But uh, but yeah, if somebody can figure out a way to do that, um, yeah, the, that could be really impressive work. But uh, yeah, it's it's not but, it's not trivial at all. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I'm sure it's not trivial. One of yeah. the things that, that kind of caught my my thinking was, you know, if you like, how would you actually say? You know, how do you determine that that yeah. function of what is similar, right? Because like those models might be looking at features that, uh, you know, you're not yeah. giving the same weight as, as yeah. The, the, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you're but right. But it yeah. still works, but it sounds like it still works. So it works, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. you know, in certain applications, not all of them, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your question.
Any other questions for Anthony? Um, I might have a naive question. Uh, mm -hmm. Um. In uh, in one of uh, in earlier in the presentation, uh, there was a situation where you would generate a new set of data, okay, and then uh, based on that, uh, including the original, you'd generate another set, another set, almost like a cascade. Mm -hmm. How how do you prevent um, magnifying the error? Can you, can you repeat the last uh, part, sorry? How 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 would you prevent magnifying the error if you keep building on, uh, if you keep building more uh, samples, data samples from one original, uh, yeah. adding new, how do you know you're not adding more error or compounding the error? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, okay. So I think, so what you're talking about is the, um, is, is, the grid and boosting algorithm. I think that's the one you're thinking yes. of. Yeah. Yeah. So this is one of the current state of the art ways to do ensemble learning. Uh, and then, yeah. So you, so the, the question you're asking is, is actually, it was one of the main issue with the original proposal of gradient boosting, because um, basically say you fit your first uh, model or learner, and then you get your first residuals. Right. And then originally in the original proposal is, they fit the uh, second learner directly on these residuals. But then, uh, at, and then your, your question I think was, and correct me if I'm wrong, is um, now if you com combine these two learners, you might not get necessarily a good prediction because you're combining something that was trained on the original data and now on these residuals, is, is that? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah, so, so there's, um, there were a few uh, ways to, to sort of go around this problem. So now there's something called a learning rate. So uh, now to obtain this new data one here, instead of just doing uh, say the original data minus the prediction, and then this is new data one, is what they do is they only use uh, a small proportion of the prediction of the first learner so that it's not so greedy. So you don't, end up with just the raw residuals of your first learner, you only uh, start with uh, uh, a much larger error because you only use a small proportion of the prediction of the first learner. I don't know if I'm doing a, a good explanation, but uh, basically what I can do is maybe point you to something called the, the learning rate of gradient boosting and it addresses that problem. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and Thank you. I, I yeah. mean, I, uh, it's, I yeah I try to follow, but uh, yeah. it helps to yeah. understand. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, if, if you go, I think even the Wikipedia page of, of gradient boosting, I think there's yeah. a whole section that explains something on the learning rate, and it's to basically avoid this this problem of um, uh, overfitting each model to your data or overfitting to the residuals at each step. Is you only use a small proportion of that learner to compute the residuals. Um, for the next iteration of the gradient boosting algorithm. So, yeah. All right. Any other questions for Anthony? No, just a quick comment. Thanks for coming, Anthony. It was uh, very interesting. Thanks. All right. Then well, I look forward to meeting all of you next year. So. <laughs> Yeah, we're also looking forward um, uh, to that. And uh, thanks a lot for this great talk, Anthony, then. Yeah, thank thanks you so much. Anthony. Thank right. you. See you all Bye. soon. Bye. Bye. Take care.